May I present one of the sons of Yisraelbo, Nabiah Hawkins. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. You may be seated. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. The title of my speech today is The Two Witnesses and Prophecy. Prophecy shows that in these last days, there will be a work started by two men known as the Two Witnesses, who will be sent by Yahweh to reveal the man of sin just before the second coming of Yahshua Messiah. The prophets foretold of the two witnesses in great detail, giving their names, the time period they will be born, and details of their life and what they will teach. The two witnesses are Yahweh's witnesses, and in these last days uh, will warn mankind of the consequences that breaking Yahweh's laws has caused and what they will lead to. They will also teach man to keep Yahweh's laws. If you can turn over in the books of Yahweh to page 977, page 977, it's Revelations 11, 11 verse 3. Page 977, and it says, And I will give to my two witnesses to perform their prophetic offices, and they will foretell events about the three and one half years those cast about with darkness. So we can see from that scripture that the two witnesses will teach about a specific time period. The prophet Isaiah also spoke of this time period. If you could turn over to Isaiah. So page 544. Isaiah 24, verse 5 and 6. So page 544. And it says, The earth also was defiled under the inhabitants of it, because they have transgressed the law, changed the ordinance, and broken the everlasting covenant. Because of this, the curse has devoured the earth, and they who dwell therein are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. The prophet Isaiah is speaking of a nuclear burning. It is also shown in Matthew 24, verse 29. If you could turn there. Matthew 24, verse 29. So on page 753. Matthew 24, verse 29. And it says, Immediately but after the great tribulation of those days will the sun be darkened and the moon will not give her light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. The prophet Daniel also spoke of this time period when the two witnesses will come. If you turn over to Daniel, Daniel 12, it's on page 684. Page 684, Daniel 12 and it's uh, verse 4 and 5. And it says, But you, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book till the time of the end. Many will run to and fro, and knowledge will be increased. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood two others, one on this side of the bank of the river, and one on the other side of the bank of the river. Daniel saw the two witnesses in these last days, a time when knowledge would be increased. Computers, modern technology, and the nuclear bombs were all invented in this last generation. I have an article here, and it says the start, it talks about the starting of the nuclear bomb, and it says, on July 4th, 1934, Leo Sizzler filed the first patent for the method of producing a nuclear chain reaction also known as a nuclear explosion. So the nuclear bomb was first patented in 1934. Matthew 24, verse 7, also gives us details of what this time period would be like. If you turn over uh, to Matthew 24, verse 7, it's on page 752. Matthew 24, verse 7, and it says... 
For a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilence and disease epidemics and earthquakes in place after place. If you look out in the world today and watch the news, we can see this is clearly what is going on at this time. I have another article here, and it says, World War III could very easily turn into the very first nuclear war in the Middle East. It stated February the 22nd, 2016, and reading an excerpt from it, it says, A source close to Russian President Vladimir Putin said that the Russians have warned the Turkish president that Moscow was prepared to use tactical nuclear weapons, if necessary, to save their troops in the face of a Turkey, Turkish Saudi onslaught. Since Turkey is a member of NATO, any such conflict could quickly escalate into a full-scale nuclear confrontation. It goes on to say, The bottom line is simple and obvious. The Russians are not making any threats. They are preparing for war. In fact, by now they are ready. So we can see that this is the time period we are in, the one that the two witnesses would preach about. Yisrael Hawkins, Yahweh's last day's witness, has been warning the world of the end result of sin for decades. Isaiah 44, verse 1 through 8, talks about the two witnesses and tells you their names. If you can turn there, turn to, it's on page 588. Page 588, Isaiah 44, verse 1 through 2 and 8. And it says, Yet hear, O Yisrael, or yet hear, O Yaakov, my servant, and Yisrael, whom I have chosen. This is what Yahweh says, who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you. Do not be afraid, Yaakov, my servant, and Yisrael will love Yisrael, who I have appointed. And down here in verse 8 says, do not fear nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared, You are my witnesses? It tells you that there will be brothers from the same womb. Yitro Hawkins and his brother Jacob Hawkins worked together to establish the House of Yahweh in 1983 in Abilene, Texas. After Jacob's death, Yitro Hawkins has continued to fulfill his prophetic office as shown in Matthew 24, verse 14. You don't have to turn there, uh, but I'll, I'll read it. And it says, this, And this joyous message of the kingdom of Yahweh shall be preached at all the world from the house of Yahweh at Abel by the witness of Yisrael, for Yahweh will be with him. Uh, he will preach this message to all nations, and then the end will come. Zechariah 6, verse 11 through 13, shows the work the last day's witness, Yisrael Hawkins, will do under the guidance of our Savior, Yahshua Messiah. You can turn from there. Zechariah 6, verse 11 through 13. It's on page 719. And it says, Take the silver and gold and make crowns and set them upon the head of Yahshua, son of Yahshua, the high priest. Speak to him and say, This is what Yahweh of hosts says. Behold the man whose name is the branch, for he will branch out of his place, and he will build the house of Yahweh. Yes, he will build the house of Yahweh. He will bear glory and will sit and rule on his throne. He will be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace will be between them both. It will be between Yahshua and the branch. We can see that Yahshua Messiah himself is working with Yisrael Hawkins to finish the work the two witnesses started in these last days, as foretold by the prophets. <laughs> Yahweh's house has been established by the two witnesses, Yishul and Jacob Hawkins, and soon you will see Yahshua coming to take his reign, and all kingdoms and governments will be given to the people of the saints of Yahweh, putting an end to sin and bringing in everlasting life. And with that, if you all please stand, I'll turn it over to the next speaker for today.
At this time, if you all remain standing, it's my privilege and honor to introduce to you son of Israel Abel, Deacon Israel Abel Hawkins. Shabbat shalom, everyone. You all may be seated. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. The title of my sermon today is Walls Don't Bring Peace. Now, as we have seen recently, you know, many of the politicians have been advertising about building uh, walls between the United States, us, the United States, and the people of Mexico down south. And uh, if I could have my first video, please. And our country's falling apart. And I just wanted to do this. And you mentioned wall. I mean, I will build the greatest wall that you've ever seen. All right, so that's just one example of, you know, how they're talking about building this wall. Uh, And if you do, according to the uh, United States Geological Survey, uh, the United States and Mexico borderline is an estimated... 1,933 miles. Uh, Other sources say that it's 2,000 miles. But it's a big wall uh, that they're going to have to build if they're going to build it. Another thing they would have to do is put millions of guards there, you know, to guard the wall, make sure, you know, no one's trying to cross it with ladders or, or ropes. And then you have to put other guards there to guard those guards to make sure that they're not letting people through. I have an article uh, here, and it's from CNBC.com. It says, the United States border with Mexico is roughly 2,000 miles long and underlines four states from California to Texas. And here's a picture uh, of the, the border line, California, Arizona, New Mexico, and then Texas. Uh, It is a massive stretch of land, it says here. The Berlin Wall spans just 96 miles comparatively, and it costs about $25 million to build in 1961, or around $200 million with inflation, which is the prices increasing. About 670 miles of fencing on the United States-Mexico border was completed in accordance with with the, Bush, with the Bush Administration's Secure Fence Act of 2006. That alone cost $2.4 billion for roughly one-third of the entire border. And people still make it through that. It's, not, it's a lot more expensive than we expected when we started, and it was much more difficult. According to, the, to a Government Accountability Office 2009 report, The cost to build one mile of fencing at the border averaged between 2.8 million and 3.9 million. But that figure may be low relative to costs for future sections of the wall. Now listen to this part here. Uh, At some of the the, some of the figures here for the money. The actual cost for the rest of the border wall roughly 1,300 miles, uh, could be as high as $16 million per mile. $16 million per mile, with a total price tag of $15 billion to $25 billion. Rosenblum said the $15 billion uh, low-end estimate, $15 billion low-end estimate is probably an underestimate because the parts that have yet to be fenced are the most difficult, the most dense and arid. At $16 million per mile, and with 1,300 miles to secure, the estimated cost would be $12 billion. And the price of private land acquisitions and maintenance of fencing could push that total cost higher. And now what about maintaining the wall and also, you know, putting guards there? It says here the United States government would have to pay to maintain the wall, which could cost as much as $750 million a year, 
According to an analysis conducted by Politico, and then if it wanted to man it with personnel, that would be an additional cost. Border Patrol has an operating budget of $1.4 billion for 21,000 agents. This is actually the best way to think about the real cost of ex- installing or maintaining fencing, Rosenblum said. A fence is useless without a camera to tell you when someone has climbed over it. That's one of the ways, you know, they're getting over it with ladders, uh, ropes, things like that. So you have to put cameras there, which, is, which adds another expense, uh, you know, watching to make sure people don't get over There's one more aspect to the plan that can make it even costlier. They're talking about a wall, not a fence. If he really means what he says, the price would go up quite a bit. The existing border wall is actually fencing, and in some areas not even fencing, but vehicular barriers. So for 1,000... 1,300 miles, it would be as high as $16 million a mile. So it said the total would be $15 billion, which they said that was the low estimate, up to $25 billion. And, you know, we see the same problem today. You know, the people that are building uh, caves, digging caves, tunnels, you know, to go under the wall. And they go over the fencing, you know, that's, that they already have up and that they're putting up. Uh, This article here, the ins and outs of the U.S.-Mexico border tunnels, it talks about some of the the tunnels that people have dug to get under it. It said, how far do these tunnels go into the the United States, and where are they found? As far as a third of a mile in some cases, the tunnel ends are hidden under the floors of buildings, like homes or warehouses, where it wouldn't seem out of the ordinary to see some people going in and out. Now, here's a picture of one of the, the inside of one tunnel that they discovered. Here you can see the lighting, uh, and they got the walls, you know, they got boards there. Uh, how big are the tunnels and who builds them? They can stretch as far as 1,800 feet long but are narrow. They are usually about 60 feet below ground and are generally in the 3 foot by 4 foot range. How long do they take to build and how much do they cost? Some can be built in as little as six months, but others can take up to a year. The costs range from 800000 to $1 million. Now what kinds of tunnels are there and what are they for? Tunnels are placed in three categories. Uh, rudimentary, interconnecting, and sophisticated. Rudimentary tunnels are gopher-like tunnels that are short, and shallow and simple and might be found under a border fence, so just to get uh, people under the fence. They're used for smuggling people. Uh, The next one, interconnecting tunnels, are more complex than rudimentary ones, but less the sophisticated er category. They're tunnels that ultimately connect to underground water or sewer systems, and they're also used to smuggle people. And then the last type here, sophisticated tunnels, are longer, deeper underground and require far more work. Agents consider a tunnel sophisticated if it's outfitted with rails, get this, rails and carts, lights and the ventilation system. So they put a lot into these tunnels that they dig, you know, to get uh, people and other things, you know, across the, the fence or this border. And uh, other ways, you know, that they get across, they use shipping containers, uh, people hide in the trunks of cars, they have many other ways. And I talked about the ladders, you know, and these people, they laugh as they get across uh, when they go through the fence or things like that. And they only have a little portion of the border fenced right now, and people make it through uh, with the ladders and tunnels like I talked about. Now, how immigration works is the name of this article, and it's from uh, people.howstuffworks.com. It says here, estimates vary significantly as to how many illegal immigrants are are living, living in the United States. Some experts claim 7 million, while others say as many as 20 million. 
and talks about some of the ways they use uh, homemade rafts, uh, which they try to navigate the 90 miles of water uh, to South uh, Florida. Continuing on here, it says the Border Patrol guards more than 6,000 miles of land borders and 2,000 miles of coastal water, utilizing checkpoints, aerial and ground vehicles, and high-tech surveillance equipment. Uh, and, they, and though they catch many people trying to sneak across the border, thousands of people do manage to enter the United States illegally every year, 500,000 by some estimates which raises many concerns, including terrorism. In September, 2000, September 2006, Congress passed a bill to build 700 miles of fencing along the Mexico border. Since 1994, the United States government has been building a fence along parts of the California-Mexico border, though that fence still isn't finished. To build 700 miles of fencing would be extremely expensive, Estimates range, range from four to eight billion dollars for a physical fence and the virtual fence that uses sophisticated surveillance technology could cost up to 37 billion. And that's to, so they know, you know, when people are crossing. And as I said earlier, you know, it cost, it would cost them 750 million dollars a year to man it with agents. So you can see that building a wall, you know, is not the, the best idea, plus it's very expensive. The cost of building up to $16 million a mile and then putting the guards there. So they're searching for an answer, you know, to stop the people from coming over, you know, into the, the United States illegally. And like Isaiah prophesied of, you know, they're... They're searching, they're looking for that answer. And if you'll turn over to Isaiah chapter 59. Uh, found on page 567, Isaiah 59. And let's look at verse 10. It says, We grope for the wall like the blind. And we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night, and we, are des and we are in desolate places as the dead. So who has the answer? Can anyone say who has the answer? Yisrael Hawkins, you know, the house of Yahweh. We have the answer, and it's free. It's simple, and it's smarter. Praise Yahweh. So we do have the answer. The answer is free. The Peaceful Solution Character Education Program. In the respect unit of the Peaceful Solution, the respect unit, on page 85, which is the introduction to chapter 4, here, let me show it to you here, uh, it's entitled Respect and Society. In the first paragraph, it says, if we lived in a society where everyone was respectful of others and their belongings, problems such as physical and verbal abuse, as well as crimes that involve theft and murder, would cease to exist. Think about it. A world where no one disrespects others and everyone interacts with concern and consideration for the next person. Impossible, you say. Well, not if everyone starts to develop a positive moral character. So, you know, the people have to respect others' possessions. And also in the grade 5 unit, uh, do not steal, on page 215, which is unit 4, lesson 6, uh, and it's entitled, No Trespassing. In the second uh, procedure for the lesson plan, it says, explain, well it says here above, the, it says, uh, tell students, the second sentence of the second procedure, it says, tell students that today they will learn how to use self-control to respect others by not trespassing onto someone else's private property. Explain that the word trespass means unlawful entry onto someone's property. 
Trespassing is a serious offense that can result in police involvement, danger, and injury. And looking over to the next page, and the uh, procedure number five, it says, it says, explain to students that unless they have been invited or given permission by the owner of the property, they have no lawful reason to enter someone's private land, home, or even vehicle. Stress that entering a private area for any of the above reasons is not using self-control. It is making the wrong choice. And it says here, remind students in procedure six that a wrong choice is one that disrespects others or their belongings, their private property, breaks the rules, no trespassing allowed, and is impulsive. Someone double dares you or you feel left out. Emphasize that a wrong choice results in consequences. When the law is broken by trespassing onto someone's property, the owner may call the police, you may get arrested, you may put yourself or others in danger, or you may even cause injury to yourself and others. And then it has the STOP acronym there, which we all should know and, uh, and practice in our everyday lives. And the answer is free. Like I said, you know, the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program. And both sides needs, need to be taught. The United States, you know, Texas, the people on our side of the border, and also the people down south need to be taught the peaceful solution not to trespass. So the walls won't bring peace, but teaching the people, teaching the people the peaceful solution, that is what is going to bring peace. Praise Yahweh. And teaching them not to trespass. And we would see an end to, to this problem here, and we wouldn't have to spend billions of dollars, you know, in building walls, maintaining it, putting guards there. You know, if everyone would only apply, you know, the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program. Well, with, all, with that, uh, if you'll all please stand. It's my great honor and privilege to present to you the next speaker, uh, Sonny Yitzhel Abel, Deacon Yitzhel David Hawkins. Shalom, everyone. Please be seated. Today I'd like to talk about the, uh, the uh, importance of the pattern that Yahweh set from the beginning and following it exactly in order to prevent curses in our lives. And uh, really I'd like to continue where Deacon Samuel Hawkins left off a few weeks ago about the uh, vows that Yahweh set from the beginning and uh, how the world has turned from those vows, they've turned from Yahweh, and they've brought curses, death, sickness, disease upon themselves. Now, uh, in the beginning, of course, we know that Yahweh set a pattern. And He told uh, Moshe and all those who were sent to follow that pattern as it was set in the mountain, set on the mountain, or at Abel, at the house of Yahweh. Now, uh, in Genesis chapter 2, in verse 24, you can find it on page 2, it says, uh, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, and he shall be united to his wife in his own house, and they will therefore be as one family. Now that word united, what does that word united mean? In the Webster's Dictionary, the word united means to be in agreement or to be in unity. Okay, to be in agreement or to be in unity. Now, uh, if you remember, there was a ton of sermons brought out just recently on unity. What exactly is unity? Well, we know that unity is uh, everybody is keeping the laws of Yahweh in service to one another. That's unity. You know, if everyone's agreeing on those set laws, that set pattern from the beginning, well, there's no fighting, there's no bickering, there's no uh, confusion. There's unity. Now, uh, and this brings true love. We'll get back to love in a moment because I want to spend quite a bit of time on it, on what exactly it is. But uh, unity brings true love. Now, in Yahweh's house, all of us have made a vow, okay, a betrothal vow to Yahshua to be preparing ourselves as holy, righteous brides to Yahshua, as a part of the priestly family. Now, this is a vow, and it's forever. It's a forever vow, okay? Remember, just like pastors brought out for years, and just like Deacon Samuel brought out a few weeks ago, it's forever. It's not to be broken. So, uh, what is this betrothal period for? What is this vow that we made, and what are we doing here in Yahweh's house? We're preparing ourselves. We're learning how to take care of the universe. Okay, on a smaller scale, you're learning how to take care of a family. You're learning how to provide for a family. In Yahweh's house, we're learning how to take care of all of Yahweh's creation, His entire universe. Okay, and we're coming to perfection, learning how to submit to the headship of Yahshua, of Yahweh, of 
Pastor Yisrael Hawkins, who's the one sent. Learning how to submit to authority, with, who are teaching us Yahweh's laws. Now, it's an eternal vow, and there's no getting out of it once you've made it. If you'll turn over to Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, on page 520. Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, and uh, verse 1. It says, Keep your foot, watch your step, when you go to the house of Yahweh, and be more ready to listen than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they do not even realize that they do evil. Now, the entire book of Proverbs and the entire book of Ecclesiastes talks about fools and tells you what a fool is. This here is telling us that if we make a vow to Yahweh, if we promise to Yahweh that we're going to keep all of His laws, and we break that vow, we're a fool. They do not even realize they do evil. Do not be rash, reckless with your mouth. Do not think of hastily uttering a word before Yahweh. Yahweh is in heaven, and you are on earth, so let your words be few. Let's go down to verse 4. It says, When you make a vow to Yahweh, do not delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Is Yahweh going to have fools run his universe? No. no, not at all. So he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed to pay. Uh, verse 6, Do not let your mouth cause your body to sin. Do not say in the presence of the Malak of Yahweh, who's the Malak? Yisrael Hawkins is a Malak, and we're making this vow in presence of Yisrael Hawkins. Do not say in the presence of the Malak of Yahweh, it was a mistake. Why should Yahweh be angered by what you said, or why should you cause curses upon yourself? Okay, you're causing curses upon yourself, causing the work of your hand to be destroyed. That's definitely not what we want. So uh, let's take a look at the vow that we made to Yahshua, the vow that we made uh, upon baptism, okay, that we would, uh, of course, keep His laws, never willfully sin. But let's look at this vow that is made and uh, that we promise to follow to become Yahshua's bride. It's uh, found in Hosea chapter 4, Hosea chapter 4 and verse 19. It says, I will betroth you to me forever. Forever. Okay, forever. Is there an end to forever? No, no there's no end to forever. Okay, so, I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness, in judgment, in loving kindness, and in mercy. So look at those words there. You have righteousness, judgment, loving kindness, and mercy. What is righteousness? Keeping of Yahweh's law, right? Where do we find that? Awesome. Deuteronomy 6.25. You keep Yahweh's law. Okay, so we're learning, of course, to keep Yahweh's law, to become perfect. Okay, the same thing in a marriage, in the house of Yahweh. Okay, we'll get to the way the world does it and how much mess it creates. But in the house of Yahweh, you learn to keep Yahweh's laws. You learn to have true love for one another. So uh, that's righteousness, keeping Yahweh's laws. In judgment, okay, when uh, you break the laws, thing, uh, curses come upon you. And you learn what those curses are so you can uh, learn how to avoid them. Okay? When you keep the law, blessings come upon you. We find that in Deuteronomy 28. It lines that out uh, very specifically. In loving kindness, we're going to go into in, in a lot deeper on what love is. Loving kindness and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you will know Yahweh. Okay? So uh, there's the vow that we made, that we made to Yahshua upon coming to the house of Yahweh. Or that Yahshua has made and that we are to follow. So uh, you need, I, want, I want all of you to take some time to look at these words, righteousness, judgment, loving kindness, mercy, and faithfulness, and learn exactly what they mean and exactly what you're stepping into by uh, promising that you're going to keep Yahweh's laws, by promising to uh, take care of somebody forever. Uh, and what does it mean to know Yahweh? Does it just know you know His name? No, knowing Yahweh is following His every word, keeping His laws, okay? So, uh, keeping the laws of Yahweh, which is true love, brings blessings. Breaking Yahweh's laws brings curses. So let's look at how the world has turned from this wonderful pattern of Yahweh and brought curses upon itself. So, in the world, there's no sense of commitment, okay, to a, to a partner. There's no sense of commitment. It's based on lust, which is the exact opposite of love. Okay, love is keeping Yahweh's laws. The world brings forth illegal lust, like it's brought forth by Hollywood. Okay? So uh, you get on Facebook, Tinder, on the internet, you go next door, however you're going to do it, and uh, you find someone you think you love, right? You love them so much. You don't even know them, but you love them so much, right? So uh, 
You should ask yourself some questions, you know, before you even step into this. How many other people have loved them so much before you decide that you love them so much? And what does that bring? Of course, it brings STD, sickness, disease, death. So uh, you love this person so much and you put on this whole show, this fake facade of who you really are, right? And you get to know this person. Well, you think you get to know this person, right? Nothing about character is brought forth. We learn in the Peaceful Solution that character is what we should base our relationships on, right? Not personality, not, fake, uh, pers not a fake personality, but a positive personality and a positive character. Get to know that person's character. We're going to go in a little bit deeper on how exactly we should do that. So uh, there's nothing brought forth about character, whether the laws of Yahweh are going to kept, whether there is actually true love there, whether you're going to care for that person, take care of them, or they're just something that you lust after. Okay? There's nothing based on Yahweh's laws, and there's nothing to see if it's going to work. It's just based on personality. In the uh, first book of Israel, chapter 26, let me find it here so I can show it to you. And here it is. The first book of Israel, chapter 26, and verse 55, it says, They tell you to go out on these stupid dating games, and you can play man and wife until you're 18. They teach you not to think about a betrothal or setting your mind on marriage or training for building a home and raising and teaching children. Now what is that? That's positive character. That's Yahweh's laws because there's actually a commitment there. There's actually positive character. This is what, that is what they used to train for. I know all of you were caught up in that same damn sinful mess that the world has done to our young children. It has changed. Now you go out and the worst years of your life is between 10 and 11 years old and 18 when they finally permit marriage. By that time, abortions have taken place. Now what are abortions? Abortion is murder. Okay? It don't matter how if they want to say that it's not alive in the womb or whatever. It's murder. Okay? It's murder. A child can learn from the womb. There's scientific proof saying that you can teach a child from the womb, yet if you kill it, it's not murder. That doesn't make any sense. So uh, that's murder. I know people who have had as many as four abortions in that time. It's a wicked damn thing that they've done in taking away the judgment of Yahweh. Remember what we learned about judgment in Hosea, okay? It's also done based on the judgments of Yahweh. So uh, that's what they do in the world, okay? And it simply leads to fornication, adultery, sin, STDs, and death. So uh, say it works out in your mind. It's working out so far, okay? And you're getting along, all right? And, uh, but your relationship is still based on lust and emotion. You might even get married, okay? And in the world, of course, they have their fake show of marriage, and you spend, what was it, uh, $26,444 that Samuel brought out last week that they actually spend on a wedding. And then 50, over 50% 50 of marriages in the United States end in divorce. That's because those marriages are based on lust. They're based on emotion. So, uh... And then that's, that's what occurs when one of your character actually surfaces. They realize that you'll steal from them, or you'll cheat on them, or you'll lie to them, because your positive, your true character actually starts coming out. So uh, that's the world's way. Let's take a look at the vows that they have in the world, the, uh, the vows. All right, so to have and hold from this day forward for better or for worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish as long as we both shall live. That's really cute, isn't it? So, uh, did you see anything there? That word love. The world doesn't know what love is. Okay? They're, they're basing their relationships on lust. We're going to go into what the world uh, thinks love is and the peaceful solution. It actually explains it. But uh, there's nothing about true love. There's nothing about actually taking care of one another or making sure that you're not going to do anything to harm the other person, that you're going to show respect for that person, which is taught in the Peaceful Solution. True love is positive. Okay, and the self-control unit... Sorry, mine's a little bit tattered. But uh, the self-control unit teaches us what true love is. Okay? So uh, the self-control unit, page, thir page 32... Uh, let me get there. Page 32 teaches what true love is. Love is feeling a strong, a strong concern for someone or something, 
arising out of care. Now look at what I have underlined there. I have the words care and concern. Okay, what is care and concern? Respect. Exactly. That's what we learn in the Peaceful Solution. From a young age, from the first unit of the Peaceful Solution, you learn that to have respect is to show care and concern. So what is respect? Well, if you respect somebody, you're not going to do anything to harm them, are you? You're not going to do anything to harm their property, their possessions of property. You're not going to do anything to harm their environment. You're going to show morality to them. You're going to keep Yahweh's laws to them. So uh, also on uh, page 33... There's a, it talks about the emotion, the, uh, the, the word love. Okay, the world sees it as an emotional, fluffy feeling of lust. But we see that uh, this is wrong. This false concept of love accounts for approximately one million teen pregnancies every year. At, at least one quarter of these pregnancies end in abortions, numbering 274,000. And that number has gone up drastically since then. Okay? In addition, every year about 3 million teens acquire sexually transmitted diseases. Now it's 20 million new cases of STDs every year. 20 million. Some of these diseases have no cure. We know in the house of Yahweh, you know, in the book of Jeremiah, it says your diseases are incurable. There are no cure. The doctors might say they have a cure, but it simply hides the symptoms and then you die of heart disease or diabetes or uh, cancer later on in life. But of course, that had nothing to do with your STD, right? Of course not. So if you think you love someone, control your emotions. Remember, true love is not instant. True love is a bond of mutual, mutual trust, interest, and deep caring for one another. Well, what is that? That's unity. Mutual trust, that's unity. True lasting love is based on the principles of moral character or the laws of Yahweh that we're learning. It takes time for a bond like this to form between people. Get to know that person through conversation. Whether you are under adult supervision, in the house of Yahweh, of course, is through the supervision of the counselors. Whether you're under adult supervision or if you're an adult yourself. A person without moral values can cause daily stress on a person who is trying to do what is right. That's what's worked out in the betrothal time period, okay? And, and during the counseling before betrothal. You work out any kinks that are there, any sin that might be taking place in order to destroy a relationship because sin destroys relationships. It causes divorce. Praise Yahweh. So uh, a person without moral values will cause daily stress on a person who is trying to do what's right. If both of them aren't trying to do what's right, well, that's going to definitely end in divorce. There's going to be fighting. You know, and uh, all of you, uh, I'm sure, have heard of, you know, the domestic violence cases that take place. Uh, child abuse. Well, you know, you've heard of children being uh, left in dumpsters and things like that because the laws of Yahweh aren't there. This is what the worldly relationships lead to. A person whose mind is constantly on gaiety can cause mental anguish to a person whose mind is on peace. Peace comes through what? Keeping the laws of Yahweh. If suitable characters are matched, what does that, what does that show? Suitable characters being matched. Unity, exactly, unity. Remember, you and I together in Yahweh, right? So that's keeping the laws of Yahweh. Disagreements are, and divorce are rare. If suitable characters are matched in the house of Yahweh, divorce should never take place. Divorce is unlawful. Praise Yahweh. Get to know this person through conversation, through counseling, of course, before you join hands and say vows. Vows, okay? Notice the peaceful solution, how it's putting that out there for the world, showing that, you know, this isn't just some kind of silly thing that's going to go on and then you're going to break up and find someone else and then break up and find someone else and get STDs and die. This is a vow. It should be forever. This way you will avoid acting impulsively and making decisions you will regret. That's Yahweh's way of doing things. Praise Yahweh. So, uh, also, uh, let's see here. Okay, turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28. And uh, let's start at verse 1. These are the blessings that come forth when, uh, when the laws of Yahweh are kept, okay? It says, And it will be if you will diligently, if you will listen diligently to the voice of Yahweh your Father by observing and doing all his laws, which is what? That's love. When you keep Yahweh's laws, that's true love. 
uh, which I command you this day, that Yahweh your Father will set to you high above all the nations on earth as his kings and priests. Well, that's what he wants to do for his entire universe. Universe. He wants us to be the leaders, the teachers of the universe. All these blessings will come upon you and accompany you because you obey Yahweh your Father. Blessed will you be in the city, in the country. Blessed will be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, your livestock, the calves of your herds, and the lambs of your flocks. Blessed will be your basket and your storehouse. Blessed will you be when you come in, when you go out. And keep reading these. All these blessings will come once you keep Yahweh's laws. These are promised by Yahweh. And Yahweh's not slack on His promises. Let's jump down to uh, verse 15. However, if you do not obey Yahweh your Father and do not carefully follow all His laws and His statutes, which I command you this day, then all these curses will come upon you and accompany you. Now remember, Yahweh said these things will take place if you break Yahweh's laws. If you look at the world, they're taking place. You see them taking place. Is this what you want to become a part of? No. So keep Yahweh's laws. Do it Yahweh's way. Cursed will you be in the city. Cursed will you be in the country. Cursed will be the fruit of your body, the produce of your land, the calves of your herd, the, la the lambs of your flocks. Cursed will you be when you go in, come out, uh, and... Uh, Drop down to verse 30. This is what occurs in the world. Okay? You will be betrothed to be married with a woman, but another person's going to take her. You will build a house, but you will not live in it. You will plant a vineyard, but you will not gather his, its grapes. Okay? So, uh, these, this is what takes place in the world. It causes fighting. It causes murder in the world today because the laws of Yahweh aren't kept. Because vows aren't kept. So, uh, in the third book of Israel, chapter 15, in verse 43, pastor says, back to this love now. I didn't forget it. I, I didn't forget it. See, I got back on my point without having to ask you. Concerning love, the world has this emotional kind of love. That's mostly just from lust, which shows emotions. It comes forth in the spur of the moment. It's never really based on anything that is substantial, like the love that you have here, where it's based on the 613 laws that actually show you what true love is. So if both people, or all of us in Yahweh's house, as Yahshua's bride, are following Yahweh's laws, well, we'll all have love for one another. There won't be fighting and disputes and arguments. The same thing in a relationship. If both people are keeping Yahweh's laws, that's true love for one another. It's respect. You guide everything uh, in your marriage in the raising and training of your children with this love that is actually based on Yahweh's laws. So you teach your children this same love. You are thinking in advance and have your plans in advance. You have your mind actually made up in advance so you won't go contrary to this. It's a mindset that you have to have that you're going to keep these vows and you can't break them. This, that is the love that Yahshua was speaking of that he talked about in this verse. When he was talking about the love, he said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Do what I say, in other words. If you love me, do what I tell you to do, as I have also loved you and demonstrated. Yahshua actually demonstrated how he loved us, all of us. So uh, please, everybody, take your vows seriously. If you'll turn over from my last scripture to Deuteronomy chapter 26 and uh, verse 17 on page 168. It says, This day you have declared Yahweh to be your father, and that you will walk in his ways and keep his statutes, his laws, and his judgments, and that you will obey him. And Yahweh has also declared this day that you are his special people, his treasured possession as he has promised, and that you are to keep all his laws. He has declared that he will set you high above all nations that he has made, in praise, in name, and in honor, that you may be a holy people to Yahweh your father, just as he has promised. That's speaking of all of us, brother. That's speaking of all of us. Okay? Pastor said that it's such a, per a perfect pattern that Yahweh gives us to follow there that we can keep all the diseases that we're seeing today and the confusion of the mind away from us. These things come from war and fighting. Well, they cause war and fighting. Praise Yahweh. So uh, please, take your vows seriously. Don't go the way of the world. It's opposite of the way of Yahweh and it brings death upon yourself. Yahweh's pattern of love is perfect and it's proven from the beginning. So please choose life, everybody. Please choose life. If you'll all please stand. I'd like to turn it over to the next speaker, the great Kahan David Heimerman Hawkins. Shabbat shalom, everyone. It's an honor and a privilege to address the called out ones of the house of Yahweh. You may be seated. <clears throat> 
called out ones of the house of Yahweh not only gathered here at Abilene, but spread throughout the entire world at this time. The title of the sermon today is, And the Woman Fled into the Wilderness. And of course, the woman, the woman is talking about Yahweh's plan from the beginning to bring forth a righteous priesthood. Okay, can everybody see that? I'd like to begin... Uh, if you, if you could all turn to uh, chapter uh, Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12, let's begin reading in verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. Now this great wonder in heaven that is being spoken of here is the great plan of Yahweh. This is the great plan of Yahweh. And that plan, some of the scriptures that talk about that plan, Genesis 126 on my slide there, on the slide. Then Yahweh said, I will make man in my image according to my likeness. And that's what we're being made into by keeping the great laws of Yahweh here at the, at the great house of Yahweh. They will have rulership over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. And also look at Yachanan 1, verse 1, and this is another place in the scriptures where it talks about the great plan of Yahweh. In the beginning was the plan of Yahweh, and the plan was with Yahweh, and the plan was Yahweh's plan. He had this all planned out, and the things we see going on in, in Yahweh's plan in these last days in the world, it's all according to Yahweh's plan. The same plan was in the beginning with Yahweh, all things were done according to it, and without it, nothing was done that was done. And in this plan was life. This is the eternal life that we're all seeking, the salvation. In this plan was life, and that life was the light to mankind. And if you look at Proverbs 6.23, it says, For the commandments are a lamp, and the law of Yahweh, the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way to life. Okay, and this, uh, this second slide here is a continuation of uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. And the moon was under her feet, and upon her head was a crown of 12 stars. Now the word moon there, uh, speaking of, and, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon was under her feet. The word moon, it, it means brilliancy, you know, Yahweh had a brilliant plan here, an awesome plan. It's uh, through the idea of attractiveness or, or beauty. It's a wonderful plan. And a part of this plan is that the, the word moon there comes from a Greek word 138, and it, 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 it means to take to oneself, that is to prefer. I mean, we have to prefer the plan of Yahweh the laws of Yahweh. We have to take it to ourselves. That's part of Yahweh's brilliant plan here. In other words, we have to choose his, his plan. And Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, Yahweh inspired to be written, I call heaven and earth as witness against you this day that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses, because you are free agents to make your own choice between righteousness and evil, therefore choose life so both you and your children may live. And then with respect to this, the words here uh, in, in Revelation 12, verse 1, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars, this is speaking of the 144,000 priesthood. And Amasya 3, verse 1 on the slide, it says, Hear this word which Yahweh has spoken to you, O children of Israel. That's you. Against the whole family which I have brought up out of the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. So, you know, this is, you know, Yahweh knows us. He, he called us to be part of his plan if we, if we choose to be. Okay, and then verse 2 of Revelation chapter 12 here. And she, this woman, being with child, and you're going to see here that the first six verses of Revelation chapter 12 is talking about the overall plan of Yahweh. The overall plan from its 
from when Yahweh conceived it in the heavens, when he, when he began his plan, until these last days. The first six verses here of Revelation chapter 12. And she being with child, cried out, laboring in, in birth, and pained to be delivered. So in Deuteronomy, some of the scriptures that testify to this here, Deuteronomy 18 verse 15, Moshe said, Yahweh your father will raise up for you a prophet like me, speaking of Yahshua, this, this child who was born as part of Yahweh's plan to make atonement for sin. Yahweh your father will raise up for you a prophet like me from the midst of your brothers, him you must listen to. In verse 18, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command him. So Yahweh guided Yahshua. He ate butter and honey so that he may know righteousness. He had righteous parents. And so he's the child being spoken of there. Isaiah 53, verse 1, speaks of Yahshua. Who has believed our report? To him, to whom is the arm of Yahweh revealed? For he, Yahshua, will grow up before him as a tender plant and as a dry root out of dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And that's all part of Yahweh's great plan to bring forth Yahshua, <clears throat> to make atonement for for sin. And in verse, uh, in Matthew 1, verse 21, and she will give birth to a son, and you will call his name Yahshua. Yahweh is salvation, for Yahweh will save his people from their sins. So this is part of Yahweh's great plan here. And this, uh, this next slide here, verse 3 of Revelation 12, and there appeared another great wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. Red signifies sin. It, a dragon, if you look up the word, it means a fabulous serpent having seven heads and ten horns. And this is identifying a system here and seven crowns upon her head. So the, the scriptures that tend to explain this verse here, Revelation 13, 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his head ten crowns, and upon his head the names of blasphemy. And the beast that I saw was similar to a leopard, and it describes its features here, and the dragon gave him his power. So this system, this serpent system, that's governing the earth at this time, is empowered by the dragon, by the adversary, Satan. <clears throat> and the dragon gave him his power, and his throne and great authority. And Revelation 17, verse 9, and, he, and here is the mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. So this identifies the seven mountains of the city of Rome. It identifies the system that is, uh, is opposing Yahweh at this time, the Roman Catholic Church. And in verse, uh, Revelation 17, verse 12, and the ten horns which you saw are ten kings. And these are religious kings. These are ten religions. In the city, in the country of Italy today, there are eleven religions that are supported with tax money. The primary one is the Catholic Church, but then there are ten other religions that are recognized by the Italian government. And these are the horns, and these are the other ten main religions in the world today. And these are the horns that are, sp are spoken of here. And they receive authority with, as kings for one hour with the beast. And that's, that's the time period we're in now with Francis, Pope Francis, the son of perdition. He's making war against the saints for 42 moons, three and a half years. And Yachanan 1-1 there, in the beginning was the plan of Yahweh, 
Uh, and verse 5, now the light shines in darkness. You know, Yahweh's plan, his law, shines in the darkness of this world, but the darkness does not take hold of it. So speaking of the red dragon here, just wanted to show, if you look at, this is from the House of Yahweh calendar, 2015 calendar, truly a work of art. And right under the word red there, if you read it, it said, it says, sinful, unclean, the way of the world, the way we were before coming to Yahweh's house. And this is why, this, this is why she was called the red dragon, okay? Okay, and then uh, now Revelation, verse 12 here, uh, chapter 12, verse 4. And this, red, and this great red dragon, her tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven. In other words, one third of the Malachim rebelled against Yahweh and, and went with the dragon in her system and did cast them to the earth. And, and notice, and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to be delivered in order to devour her son as soon as she was born. And this, this woman is the plan of Yahweh, the plan to bring forth Yahshua. And notice, the, the dragon did everything she could to stop this plan. And she is to this day doing the same thing. But some of the scriptures that, that, that show this, Matthew 2, verse 16, then Herod, when he realized that he had been outwitted by the wise men, was exceedingly angry and dispatched orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its surrounding territory, where, who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had ascertained from the wise men. So this dragon was doing everything she could to devour the child. And, you know, this generation that we're living in right now, we have Yahweh's protection and we're going to talk about that later on in this uh, sermon here. But, you know, other eras of the house of Yahweh did not have Yahweh's protection, as Pastor has told us many times. Yeshua, in Luke 10, verse 3, he told his disciples, Go your ways. Behold, I send you out like lambs among wolves. And what do wolves do to lambs? They kill them. Then the apostle Shaul, in Acts 20, verse 29, he said, For I know this, that after my departing, grievous wolves will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. You know, the same thing. Okay, in verse, verse 5, verse 5 of Revelation 12, chapter 12, now again, this is talking about the whole plan of Yahweh. And she, the woman, brought forth a male, Yahshua, a son who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her son was caught up unto Yahweh and unto his throne. So in, in Yachanan 16, verse 7, Yahshua said, However I, Yahshua, tell you a truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I did not go away, the comforter, which is Yahweh's spirit holy, would not come to you. But if I go, I will send Yahweh's holy spirit or spirit holy to you. So this was all according to Yahweh's plan. And in, verse, uh, in, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 6, we, we see Yahshua addressing his disciples before he left them. He said, however, I, Yahshua, tell you a truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I did not go away, the Comforter would not come to you. But if I go, I will send Yahweh's Spirit Holy to you. And then in, in Acts uh, 1 verse <clears throat> 1, okay, yeah, Acts 1 verse 6. Therefore, when they had come together, Yeshua and his disciples before he left there, they asked him, teacher, will you restore Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They didn't see it, but we will see it. We will see the restoration of this kingdom in this generation. And verse 7, And he, Yeshua, said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. In verse 8, 
but you will receive power after Spirit Holy has come upon you, and you will be witnesses for me, just as, you know, Yahweh's two witnesses established his house in these last days, and we are witnesses uh, in, in, in supporting Yahweh's plan and in supporting Yahweh's servant, Yisrael Abel Hawkins, okay? And in all Yada and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth, even to the chief of the nations. In verse 9, And when he, Yeshua, had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And now he sits at the right hand of Yahweh, according to Yahweh's great plan. And then in verse 6 of Revelation 12, but notice, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by Yahweh, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Okay, so this comes right up to the end of Yahweh's overall plan, right to this current time period, right to the point where Pope Francis came into office almost three years ago now, and he's, he's got about six months left in his tour of duty, but... But uh, this, is, this brings us right up to here. The woman fled into the wilderness. He always shows his protection for us, for his house, and, and, and his, those whom he is calling in this last generation. So in Revelation uh, 3, verse 7 there, on this, on this slide, And to the Malach, Yisrael Hawkins, of the congregation of the house of Yahweh in Philadelphia, or at Abel, write these things, says, he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no man shuts, and shuts and no man opens. Because you, he's saying to Yisrael Hawkins, and to those who uh, are part of the house of Yahweh, because you have kept the word of my patience, I will also keep you from the hour of temptation. And that's that's this to. Uh, that's this 1,260 days, this, this time period, when sin is at its peak, as brought forth by the man of sin, Pope Francis, warring against all holiness, and the wars are raging and increasing and soon to, to heat up even more upon the earth. I will keep you from the hour of temptation which will come upon all the world to test those who dwell upon the earth. And verse, and uh, speaking of this, these scriptures I'm giving you, they all speak of the same three and a half years. 1,260 days, three and a half years, it's the same thing. Revelation 11, verse 2, But the court which is outside the temple, leave it out, measure it not, for it is given to the Gentiles, and the holy city they will tread underfoot three and a half years. The Francis's attack against holiness is worldwide. It's not just against the house of Yahweh. And I will give my two witnesses to perform their prophetic office, and they will foretell events about the three and a half years those cast about with darkness. This is speaking of this uh, time period where the woman fled into the wilderness also here. And Revelation 13, verse 5. And there was given unto him, this is speaking of Francis, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to make war for 42 months, which is three and a half years. Okay, here in Revelation 12. So, so that, those first six verses in Revelation chapter 12 talk about the overall plan of Yahweh. Now, we're going to go into a little more detail that pertain to this house of Yahweh, this house of Yahweh here at Abilene, and the time period we're living in. Verse, verse 7 of, of Revelation chapter 12, And there was war in heaven. Micaiah and his Malachim fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought with her angels, but did not prevail, nor was there a place found any more in heaven, and that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world. She, she has deceived the whole, the whole world. 
into the system of God worship they follow. She doesn't care what religion people are part of as long as it's not Yahweh's house of Yahweh. So, who deceives the whole world, she was cast out into the earth, and her angels were cast out with her. And in, in verse, uh, verse 10, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our Father and the power of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers is cast down, who accused them before our Father day and night. She is the accuser. So, you know, she's, she's accusing us. And, you know, so we, we, we don't want to play, we don't want to have any part in her uh, her accusations in you know in so in verse 11 and they overcame her by the blood of the lamb by Yahweh's plan to bring forth a, an unblemished lamb Yahshua and by the word of their testimony the law and the prophets and they loved not their lives unto the death okay and in verse 12 and we'll explain this a little bit more therefore rejoice you heavens and, and you who dwell in them but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because she knows she has but a short time. So if, if you're in uh, Re Revelation chapter 12 in your books of Yahweh, you can look at the side note there about this definition of short time. When she was cast into the earth, she had a short time. And it says, this short time is a span of 10 years. When, when a day in this, the Hebrew means 10 days, but as, as, as is explained here, when a day is mentioned in prophecy, such as in Yekeski 4, verse 6, shows that a day represents one year of actual time. Therefore, Revelation 12, 12 is saying that when this prophecy begins to come to pass, Satan will have 10 more years to prove that her false way can work. Here's a little timeline regarding the events that we just saw in Revelation 12, 12. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because she knows she has but a short time. 10 years to bring peace. Okay, July 16, 1994... Schumacher Levy, the uh, 21 mega, mega fragments bombarded the planet of Jupiter. That was the war in heaven, six day war in heaven. And about three years later, April of 1997, Satan arrived on the Halebop comet. And you can read all about these details in the books of Israel. And Schumacher Levy, Hail Bob, Comet, you know, those are key search words for you to find this information, this historical information that Pastor delivered to us in sermons. And so she was cast to the earth. Now, she used for the next 10, beginning, beginning October 25th, 2001, she used the Middle East Quartet to try to bring peace. To the to the to the mid, to the Middle East and to the world. So now this October 25th, 2001. I got this date from Wikipedia. This was in the first meeting where the United States, the European Union, Russia, and the United Nations met with Yasser Arafat to begin a begin a peace process. Now the quartet didn't officially become a permanent forum until the following year, May 2, 2002. And then they published the Roadmap to Peace, so the Roadmap for the Two-State Solution, July 16th of 2002. And then they, 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 they met 50, 60, 70 times, enjoyed a lot of, uh, I'm sure, uh, great food and French wine during, that, during those meetings. But the thing is, over that period of 10 years, they failed to bring peace. And in, in October 26th of 2011, they, they had one last uh, great attempt, and it was de declared a failure. 
So for those t t for 10 years, they, tr they tried to bring peace and failed to bring peace to the Mideast. The, the Middle East Quartet continues to be a working organization, but Satan's attempt to bring peace uh, this, this 10 years here ended up in failure, and the Brookings Institute issued a report in February of 2012 indicating that, the, that their efforts to bring peace were dead. Not the quartet, but their efforts to bring peace were dead. Okay, so if, looking, looking at Revelation uh, 12, verses 13 and 14 here. And when the dragon saw that she was cast into the earth, she persecuted the woman which brought forth the man. And let's read this with 14 also. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time, a times and a half from the face of the serpent. First of all, if you remember what we just saw in the timeline, you'll see that the chron chronology of 13 and 14 here, Revelation 12, verses 13 and 14, is backwards. The woman fled into the wilderness first, and then, uh, several years later, Satan was cast into the earth and went to persecute the woman. So Yahweh, in his plan, made sure that his house was protected before the adversary arrived, was cast to the earth. So, Now, looking at verse, Revelation 12, verse 14 here, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness where she has, into her place where she is nourished, fed, protected for a time, times, and a half a time from the face of the serpent. Now, first of all, this time, times and a half is different than the time, times and a half that the prophet Daniel speaks about. <clears throat> but let's look at Exodus 19, verse 4 here first. It says, you have seen what I have done to Egypt. This was in the days when the children of Israel were taken out of Egypt with Yahweh's mighty hand. You have seen what I have done to Egypt and how I carried you on wings of eagles and brought you to myself. So this is not the first time Yahweh has delivered his people on the wings of an eagle. And now, when, when, a, when a priest in the house of Yahweh holds up, you, you know, prays, lifts up with his talit on, like the two Malachim here, these, these priests of Yahweh, I think a pastor described of them in a sermon, but they, they lift up their hands, and, and you could you, it looks somewhat like like a wing, okay? But but there's more to it than than that. So uh, Exodus 19:4, you have seen what I have done to Egypt, and how I carried you on wings of eagles and brought you to myself. And now, Pastor, in he's he's referred to here in Daniel 12 verse 7 where it says, Then I heard the man, Yisrael Hawkins, clothed in linen, he's got his talit on, who on a future day is teaching. Then he held up his right hand and his left hand towards heaven. So this could give you a picture in your mind of, of Yahweh's great eagle, his last witness, ho holding up his wings. Okay, But what, what the words wings of a great eagle mean, what they really mean, just as they did in the days when Moshe brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, they mean the prayers and the leadership of the one sent, Yisrael Hawkins, who is inspired by Yahweh's Spirit Holy. That's what that means, the wings of a great eagle. And here from the 2015 calendar is the picture of the great eagle. He's got his wings down in this picture, but he's uh, looking, at the, looking at the rainbow. And I'd like to read what uh, in the half of the uh, printing above the, above the picture of Pastor there. He said, the many sightings 
of the four color rainbow and Yahweh's last day's witness in the clouds show without a doubt that Yahweh is fully aware of and nurturing and protecting his plan. This is all about Yahweh's plan coming to completion in these last days. Okay, the, the time, times, and half a time. In Revelation 12, verse 14, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, this is Yahweh's last day's witness, Yisrael Hawkins, that she might fly into the wilderness. Now this here is the wilderness. This location in Callahan County, in the Clyde Eula area, this is the wilderness. If you use your search feature in the Yisrael Says program and type in wilderness, you're going to find references in pastor's sermons where he talks about moving the house of Yahweh from the city to the country, from the city to the wilderness. This is the wilderness, okay? And, and so that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished. And this is talking about growth. It's talking about spiritual nourishment. You can talk about physical nourishment also. But it's talking about bringing a family to perfection in the laws of Yahweh, where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. So a time, times, and a half a time. If you look at the slide, this time period began at the Feast of Tabernacles, 1991. That's when this timeline began. A time is seven years. Two times, uh, times, plural, is seven times two or 14 years. And a half a time is seven divided by two, three and a half years. So if you add up those numbers, this is 24 and a half years. And the scriptures don't talk about this being shortened at all. This is a time times and a half, 24 and a half years. And so when does this time period come to completion? Feast of Unleavened Bread. This year, this year, this year, four weeks from now. Okay. <clears throat> Four weeks from now. Now, you, you know, this is, this, is, this is when this time period ends. The date of, uh, the, the date isn't really so important. It's the, it's the 24 and a half year time period. So here, Revelation 12, verse 14 again. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time, times, and a half time from the face of the serpent. Notice, it's the serpent that is, wants to destroy the house of Yahweh. And so the little timeline here, the beginning of 1991, construction began in this building where we're sitting here. This was nothing before, before this building was built. It was, it was some oak trees and I guess you could call it the hills of the forest. You know, uh, it was, it, nothing existed here at that time. Okay? So, but construction and plans began at the beginning of 1991. Now, a significant date in 1991 was the death of the, wit the witness Jacob. March 22, 1991, the witness Jacob Hawkins given to the curse as the prophecy in Isaiah 43, verse 28 says, the witness Jacob dies. And it's interesting, you know, it doesn't say that we were delivered here on wings of, a great, of, of great eagles, plural. No, it's one eagle. He always last day's witness, Yisrael Hawkins. And, and so, now the date here, so construction began in January, and nine months later, this facility was dedicated to Yahweh. Now, the, the closest date I can come up with is September 28, 1991, maybe a day or two off, but, this is, but during the Feast of Tabernacles that year, this building and these grounds were dedicated to Yahweh. Dedication of the House of Yahweh Sanctuary 
in the wilderness of Clyde, Eula, Texas, at the Feast of Tabernacles, the woman, the house of Yahweh, begins the time, times, and a half a time of nourishment and protection in the wilderness. And so 24 and a half years later is the date four weeks from now. It's March 28, 2016. And like I said, you may not see any changes on that date, but we're moving into a, another time period in the house of Yahweh. Completion of the time, times and a half of the house of Yahweh in the wilderness. So when, when, when Satan was cast to the earth, the house of Yahweh was already here in the wilderness. But notice in, in Revelation 12, verse 15, and the serpent cast out of her mouth water, which means people, as a flood after the woman, that she might cause her to be carried away by the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of her mouth. I've got an example of that, but before we move on to that, I'd like to read these last two uh, scriptures here in, on this slide here. In verse 17, And the dragon was enraged, that, that fabulous serpent was enraged with the woman, and went to make war with her. And this is the 42 moons of war that Francis is bringing against all holiness went to make war with those who forsook her seed. She's working with anyone that she can use to come against the house of Yahweh and Yahweh's plan. She went to make war with those who forsook her seed, her seed being those who keep the laws of Yahweh and have the testimony of Yeshua Messiah. And we read this before, but Revelation 13, verse 5 and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things, this is Francis, and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to make war for 42 months. This, uh, this is an example of, of the earth help the woman. And I'm sure that in the books of Israel, we can find many examples of how the, the earth helped the woman. Uh, but this is a great one, and I'd like to read, read through this so that we can see how Yahweh at times uses, you know, uh, those who are not part of the house of Yahweh for the benefit of his work. This is from the book of, eighth book of Israel, part two, and verse 19 here, let's start here. David Koresh, and these are pastors, this is from pastor's sermon. He said, David Koresh, he used the name of Yahweh and was trying to keep the feast. He saw it in the scriptures, and he was trying to keep the feast. Now, that's all I know about the man. I don't know what else he was teaching, but the news, on the news, they had a big sign, Feast of Passover. And in verse 21 here, Pastor writes, Now, they were going to hit us at that time. And at Waco, there were 65, 70 people who burned to death in the final Holocaust of that, settling that matter. And that's what they wanted to do here at the house of Yahweh. And you know, and when, a, when, when there's a raid, mistakes can be made and, and bullets can fly. You know, even though we're peaceful people, you know, things can go horribly bad. So this is a, this is a big thing here in this account that pastor's talking about here, verse 21. Now, they were going to hit us at that time I told you this before, they had planned on hitting us at that time. A lawyer, and here's the earth helping the woman, a lawyer who was also a judge at that time, and a friend of mine, a city judge in Abilene, and a friend of mine because I had worked with him on the police department. He called me and he said, you know, he said, do you know that the FBI is planning on a raid on your compound? And I said, no, and I was astonished, Pastor said. You know, I said, what in the world would they want to raid us for? You know, we're the oldest religion in the world. We're preaching the laws of righteousness. We do no harm to no one. 
why would they want to raid us? And the judge said, well, with all the rumors, there are a bunch of rumors out there about what's going on out there. I said, well, I've heard the rumors. Yes, that was pretty easy. So <clears throat> here, from the, again, from the 8th book of Israel, continuing with this account, verse 22. But anyway, I said to the judge, you know, you call the FBI and tell them I'll, I'll welcome them at the front gate. I'll meet them and welcome them and show them every inch of the property and everything we do and say. And so he did call them. He said, the guy wants to talk to you, so call him. He gave me the number, the name and number, and I called him and told him the same thing. I said, you don't even have to tell me if you don't want to when you're coming. I said, just don't bring the news media with you. That I ask of you. But you can call this attorney in Abilene, and he will meet you out there, and then you can call me and I'll come out and work with you guys. So then in verse 23 here of, the, of this account in the books of Israel, so the raid was off, but they intended, brethren, to do the same thing here that was done there in Waco because we use the name Yahweh, we teach the laws of Yahweh, so we expose their sins. So I've got a question. What will come after the time, times, and a half of time in the wilderness is completed on 3-28-2016. I believe the answer to this is that Yahweh will show a difference between his house and those people who do not have the seal of Yahweh. And so this is one thing that occurred in Egypt when Yahweh was delivering his house, his people at that time. Exodus 8, verse 22, But on that day, Yahweh said, I will deal differently with and sever the land of Goshen. Now, the land of Goshen was the agricultural region of Egypt where the children of Israel were established, where they lived. And I will sever the land of Egypt where, where my people live, no flies will be there, in order that you will know that I, Yahweh, am in this land. Notice in verse 23, I will make a distinction and put a deliverance between my people and Pharaoh's people. And I believe Yahweh's going to do that with us. It's going to be something that the Egyptians... Any other people who, you know, don't know the house of Yahweh, they can look and say, you know, those, those people, they're being treated differently than we're being treated. There must be something going on here. Because the Egyptians looked at the land of Goshen, and they saw that, that they were being treated differently. There was a distinction between, uh, for the last seven plagues that came upon Egypt, between Yahweh's people and Pharaoh's people. And Exodus 9, verse 26 here, Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel lived, there was no hail. So, turn in your books of Yahweh over to Revelation chapter 9 and verse 1. Revelation chapter 9 and verse 1. In Revelation chapter 9 and verse 1, the fifth malak sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven onto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So what is this star that's falling from heaven? Who is this star? Is it a he? Is it a she? What is this star that's falling from heaven? I believe that this star is not a he, it's not a she, it's an it. It's a nuclear bomb. It's a weapon of war. That's what is falling from heaven here. That's this star. Because notice the description here. First of all, the pronoun 
and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. It's Greek word 846, and it means, one of the meanings is a baffling wind, a baffling wind. And if you look at some of the ways this Greek word was translated, it can be translated him, it can be, can be translated her, and it can be translated it. I believe that it's speaking, it, this is an it, it's not a him and not a her. So this is speaking of nuclear weapons here, a, a single weapon or weapons falling from the sky to the earth. These bombs will open the bottomless pit, the abyss of death on the earth. You know, the term in verse 2 here, and it says, and he opened the bottomless pit. I'm going to read it, and it this bomb, this nuclear bomb, opened the bottomless pit, and notice what came out of it. There arose smoke out of the pit, the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. So this, this is the smoke and debris that will darken the sun and bring on the nuclear winter. You know, this bottomless pit... It's, 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 a, it's continual warfare. That's what it's speaking of here. Continual warfare, this bottomless pit. Retaliation, hatred, retaliation. You know, you, uh, the, an army will kill the father, and guess what? He's got a son to fill in the ranks in 10, 15 years. It's continuous retaliation, the bottomless pit. In Revelation, this next slide here in Revelation 9, and there came out of, the, out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And to them was given power as a scorpion of the earth has power. Now, the scorpions, they sting. I recently got caught up with a tiny little scorpion. The thing stung me. And, you know, that pain lasted my hand for an hour. You know, and wow, that little thing. So, you know, the, the, it's, it's talking about some real pain being inflicted on people here. And look at verse 4. But notice, notice in verse 4 here, you're going to see a distinction. Verse 4, and it was commanded them, these locusts. So, so what are these locusts? I'll explain that in just a little bit. But in verse 4, and it was commanded these locusts that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, nor any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of Yahweh in their foreheads. So notice that the locusts do not hurt any green thing or any oaky tree person, but only those who do not have the seal of Yahweh. And verse 5, And it was granted to these locusts that they should not kill them, but that they should... but. But it was granted to them that they should not kill them, but that they should torment them five months, five moons. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. So here you have a distinction. You've got the, the grass of the earth, the green, green things, and the trees are not going to be hurt. Well... Okay, but, but the others, those who don't have the seal of Yahweh, they're going to be tormented for five moons, severe torment for five moons. And because it, in verse 6 here it says, And in those days men will seek death and will not find it, and, it will, and, and, and will long to die, but death will flee from them. So now some of these words here, Revelation 9, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing. And I find it interesting that Pastor uh, is, 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 is adding the green color to this upcoming Feast of Unleavened Bread. I find that very interesting. <clears throat> neither, neither any green thing, nor any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of Yahweh in their foreheads. So the word grass here, I'll just go over these words. Grass means court or garden, okay? Earth 
it, it's a region. It can be a region, including the occupants of any of in, in this in any application. Green thing it means green, verdant, uh, and tree, an oak tree, for example, an oak, a tree. The, these are the ones that are not going to be hurt during this time. So on this slide here, people referred to as trees. You might say to me, well. Prove that it's prove that these trees are people. There, there's two scriptures here that are beautiful here. Revelation 11, verse 3. And I will give my two witnesses to perform their prophetic offices, and they will foretell events about the three and a half years those cast about in darkness. These are, as it were, the two olive trees. People referred to as trees. Righteous people referred to as trees. And as it were, the two lamps of the seven lamp lampstand, ministering for the Father of the earth. And this next one here, this, think of Yeshua and what he must have known and how he could see these writings in Revelation. He, he, under, he must have understood them even at this time to, to come up with this example for us. Yachanan 8, verse 22, Then he, Yahshua, came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and asked him to touch him, in other words, to heal him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town when he had spat on the blind man's eyes and put his hands upon him. He asked him if he saw anything. Now notice verse 24 here. The blind man looked up and he said, I see men, but they look like trees walking. So, so okay, so after the man said that, Yeshua knew these words were written for, for us to read, inspired by Yahweh. So then he said to him, verse 25, after he put his hand, after that, after Yeshua put his hands upon him again and made him look up, then he was healed and saw every man clearly. And Yeshua sent him away to his house, saying, Do not go into the town, nor tell this to any in the town. Why? Because you said everything you needed to say. It's written in the records for us to read in, these, in this last generation. This is the, another page from the 2015 calendar here regarding green. I just like to read the caption under the word green. It says, learning, understanding, a time of great growth uh, in unity and love in Yahweh's house. You know, that's, that's what we've come to, unity and love in Yahweh's house. And that should always be in our hearts and minds, unity and love in the great house of Yahweh. Okay, continuing... In, in Revelation chapter 9, and the shapes of the locusts were similar to horses prepared for battle, and on their heads were, as it were, crowns of gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. So, so this star that fell from heaven and opened this bottomless pit of warfare, so now these locusts are crawling out of the earth. Well, you know, when, in, when there's ever any major attack of any kind, Pearl Harbor, for example, they didn't get all the battle. They, they got the battleships, but they didn't get the aircraft carriers. You know, it'll be the same thing when the nuclear war starts in, these, in this last generation. They're not going to get every military base. They're not going to get every nuclear submarine or every fleet of, of ships in the sea. So what's going to occur? There's going to be retaliation with these locusts. And what are these locusts? Well, first of all, the next verse here describes the pilots and the commanders of these locusts. It says, And they had hair like the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And verse 9, And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horsepower. Actually, it says, With many horses, like many horses running to battle. But these are their engines that are uh, loaded up with horsepower and can take them very far, very fast. 
These are the F-16s, F-16s, F-35 Raptor jet fighters, the best the Chinese and the Russians have. It's their submarines, it's their Apache helicopters. This is what these locusts are that are going to crawl out of the earth and they're just going to, you know, destroy, they're just going to have a lot of sting in their tails for the people of this earth. But it says, don't hurt the trees, don't hurt the grass, don't hurt, you know, the people who have the mark of Yahweh, the seal of Yahweh. So verse 10 here, and they had tails similar to scorpions, these are the locusts, and they had a sting in their tail, and their power was to hurt men five moons, five months. And they had a king over them, so these, these, these uh, locusts have a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew language is Abaddon, destruction, but in the Greek language, his name is Apollyon, destroyer. So, who is the king over the bottomless pit? I'll give you three hints. The first one is Revelation 17, 18. And the woman you saw is that great city that rules over the kings of the earth. The second clue, Revelation 17, 11. And the beast that was and is not, indeed, he is the eighth king since the Lateran Treaty of 1929. And your final hint here, and the army will stand in his part. So who is this king over, over these, the armies of the earth, these locusts? Pope Francis, he is the king over these locusts. This slide, this slide here, this is Revelation, I'm sorry, this is Daniel chapter 12, and it's also uh, Daniel 7.25, where it talks about a time, a time, and a half a time. Now this is different than the 24 and a half years that we've been here in the wilderness. Of, of, in the wilderness. This time period started with the Oslo Accords, the signing of the peace treaty went into effect October 13, 1993, and it went for three and a half years, and Netanyahu shut it, shut it down in, the, in April of 1997. Then it went for another 14 years, from April 1997 to April 2011, and then we, we started the time of trouble, the last seven years that will be shortened. So in the, in the midst of this time of trouble, not in the direct middle of it, as if you take seven years and divide it in half, no, it was 19 months sooner than the middle. So that represents the time of, that, this, that this time period is shortened. On March 13th of, of 2011, Jorge Mario Berguglio was elected pope. Six days later, he took on the name Pope Francis. He's the king number eight. He's the man of sin, the king of fierce expression, the son of perdition, inaugurated into office of Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. He was made to appear in the midst, as uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 7 says, in the time of trouble. And he's the one who began 42 months at that time of war against all holiness. So the last seven-year time is shortened by 19 months because Pope Francis appeared on 3-13-2013. The middle, the middle is actually 10-13 of 2014, but, but he started the last 42 moons. And then, uh, so, so then he's scheduled to complete his 42 moons or months of warring against all holiness this fall, in August 30th of 2016, his, his, uh, his license expires. His license that Yahweh gave him expires in about six months now. So this, this slide here 
it, show, it shows the two time, times, and half times side by side. First of all, you have on the, in the red there on the left, on the left side, you have the time, times, and a half spoken of in Daniel 7.25 and Daniel 12 verse, 5, 12, verse 7, which began uh, October 13, 1993 with the ratification of the Oslo Accords, the, the, t the start of the time uh, of trouble in uh, 2011, completion of Pope Francis makes war with the saints for 42 months, August 30th, this coming, this coming, this coming year, six months from now. And then on the right-hand side, you've got, you've got Revelation 12, verse 14, which began when the sanctuary here was dedicated in the wilderness, 9-28-1991. It went for 24, 24 and a half years, 7 plus 14 plus 3 and a half, 24 and a half, completed in a month from now, 3-28-2016. So now if you add... If you add five months of hurt not any tree or any green thing, that brings you right up to about the completion of the other time, times, and half time. This, this you know, uh, they're five days off, but, 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 but Yahweh speaks in time periods. You know, some of the dates are exact. Some of them, you know, give them, give them a week or a month or two. I mean, you know, he, how long has he been planning this thing, you know? This, uh, this slide here this is actually the last one I have. Uremia 23, verse 7. Therefore, behold, the days come, says Yahweh, that, I will, that they will no longer say, as surely as Yahweh lives, who brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But they will say, as surely as Yahweh lives, who brought up and led the seed of the house of Israel out of the protected place and and from all countries where he had driven them. So and they will dwell in their own land. And then verse 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 twenty two, I'm sorry, second Timothy verse two verse chapter two verse nineteen. Nevertheless the foundation of Yahweh stands sure having this seal. Yahweh knows those who are his. You know, the seal of Yahweh, Yahweh knows those who are his. When Yeshua returns, he's going to look at each and every one of us with his eyes like fire, and he's going to see what's in our heart. Yeah. Yahweh knows those who are his, because everyone who reverences the name of Yahweh departs from iniquity departs from sin. That's how Yahshua is going to come free from, you know, apart from sin, as the scripture says. Brothers and sisters and children, Yahweh has nourished and protected the great house of Yahweh here in the wilderness for a time, times and half a time from the face of the serpent. That protection has overlapped with the 1260 days, which continues uh, uh, through the time Francis is in office, the house of Yahweh is being protected during the days when Pope Francis is making war against all holiness. Yahweh's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. This, this, the work of Yahweh, in Yachanan it says, this is the work of Yahweh that you believe into the one whom he has sent. Wings of a great eagle means the prayers and leadership of the one sent, Yisrael Hawkins, Yahweh's last day's witness, who is inspired by Yahweh's spirit holy. On the wings of the great eagle, the woman, the house of Yahweh, was delivered to the wilderness, and on the wings of the great eagle, Yisrael Hawkins, according to the every word of Yahweh, his wings will also deliver us to Yahweh Shema. <laughs> may Yahweh bless your understanding. You may all please stand for closing prayer.